COVID-19 awareness training. Here we will discuss the expectations, procedures, and how to prevent the spread. Our training topics will include what is COVID-19, the COVID-19 transmission routes, prevention measures including social distancing and physical separation, facial coverings, proper hand washing, disinfection of common surfaces, and then we will discuss the returning to work procedures. Is COVID-19, also known as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome or SARS-CoV-2, formerly known as 2019 in CoV, is a respiratory illness caused by a novel coronavirus originating out of Wuhan, China in December 2019. The World Health Organization declared a global pandemic on March 11th of 2020. There is community spread in many countries, with the total coming to 216 countries, areas, or territories, according to the World Health Organization, as of May 27, 2020. First, let's discuss how is disease transmitted. There are necessary conditions, including the presence of pathogens or germs, a sufficient number to cause infection, the ability to cause disease, a way to get into the host, and the host must be susceptible to the infection. All of the necessary conditions listed have to occur for you to become sick with an infectious disease. We will always assume that germs are present, even when they may not be. Fortunately, when these organisms are outside of the body, they start to die off, and the ones that are able to survive may be too damaged to make us sick. We cannot count on all of that to be true all of the time, though, so we have to block them from getting to us in the first place. If they should happen to slip by, our immune system will try to defend us. Different routes of entry to enter your body. The first one is inhalation, which is entry through the respiratory tract or lungs. The second is using mucous membranes, which are the linings of openings in the body, including your eyes, nose, and mouth. Different pathogens will use different routes of entry. Pathogens of the respiratory system would prefer to be inhaled, but mucous membranes of the nose and mouth may also be used as routes of entry. COVID-19 mode of transmission. There are three different types of transmission routes. The first one is direct contact or person to person contact with an infected individual or an exchange of bodily fluids with an infected person. The fluids in the case of COVID-19 pathogens are expelled from the respiratory system of the infected person. They can be released by coughing and sneezing. The second mode is aerosol transmission, which occurs when someone has coughed or sneezed, releasing pathogens into the air. They can be suspended in the air for various amounts of time based on their size, and can be carried by air currents into other areas of a room or connected spaces where they can be inhaled by you. The COVID-19 does not appear to need the force of a cough or sneeze to be propelled into the air. Breathing and talking normally have been suggested as ways for this germ to be released close to where the infected person is standing or sitting. The last mode is indirect transmission which occurs when you touch objects and surfaces contaminated with pathogens, then touch your face near mucous membranes, the sharing of phones, tablets, workstations, tools, and other items can easily transmit pathogens from an infected person to you without you ever touching that person. Contamination will not be visible on these objects and the pathogens will have different survival times in the environment. COVID-19 symptoms. Common symptoms can include a dry cough, shortness of breath, or difficulty breathing, and fever. Less common symptoms include chills, muscle pain, sore throat, new loss of taste or smell, and nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Symptoms of COVID-19 may appear in as few as two days or up to 14 days after exposure to an infected individual or surface. Anyone can have mild to severe symptoms. Older adults and people who have severe underlying medical conditions like heart or lung disease or diabetes 
seem to be at higher risk for developing more serious complications from the COVID-19 illness. When to seek medical emergency medical attention. Look for emergency warning signs for COVID-19. If someone is showing any of these signs, seek emergency medical care immediately. They have trouble breathing, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, new confusion, the inability to wake or stay awake, and bluish lips or face. This list is not all possible symptoms. Please call your medical provider for any other symptoms that are severe or concerning to you. Call 911 or call ahead to your local emergency facility. Notify the operator that you are seeking care for yourself or someone else who may have COVID-19. There are several COVID-19 testing locations available in Lubbock. There are drive-through appointment-only locations located at the Patterson Library, Walmart on Quaker, and the Wolforth Family Healthcare Center. Please call ahead to make appointments and check their hours of operation. There's also appointment-only testing at several locations in Covenant and UMC. Check their websites for the latest location information and appointment setting procedures. The Student Wellness Center and Faculty Staff Clinic located on campus is also available as a medical resource for you. There are phone numbers available for the faculty staff line and the student line. Now we will talk about the prevention measures that we can all take to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. The first topic of discussion is social distancing and separation. Keeping the space. Social distancing is the practice of maintaining six feet or roughly two meters of distance between people. Social separation is using staggered shifts to reduce the population of a work area during any given time period or having people conduct work in separate work areas. Achieving social distancing and reducing exposure. There are many different ways that we can work together to help to prevent the spread of COVID-19. We can establish separate workstations six to 10 feet apart. Ideally, you want to have 144 square feet per person. Avoid workstations that face one another for example, do not use both sides of a laboratory bench. Move shared equipment to an easily accessible location by all parties. Reduce the exchange of materials if possible and make walkways one directional if possible. Work to establish a separate entrance and a separate exit for the work area. This means one door for people to enter the work area and a separate door for people to exit the work area. This can be done in collaboration with the Texas Tech Fire Marshal's Office and ADA Office. Use tape or other markers to designate six feet from desk areas, particularly in reception areas where they may be receiving guests. Install plexiglass walls if needed and avoid gatherings larger than 10 people. Avoid smaller gatherings if social distancing principles cannot be maintained. The next type of prevention measure we will discuss are facial coverings. The CDC recommends whenever you are in public to wear a cloth face covering over your nose and mouth. President Skuvenek announced on June 24th that students will be required to wear a mask or face covering when attending an in-person class. Face masks or other appropriate face coverings will be required inside campus buildings and outside when social distancing is not possible by all students, faculty, and staff. Faculty and staff are also required to wear appropriate face coverings when in all campus buildings, except when alone in their own private office or workspace. Why do facial coverings work? First, Asymptomatic, including pre-symptomatic infected individuals, are infectious. Two, the respiratory droplets from infected individuals are a major mode of transmission. And three, your face mask actually reduces the droplet dispersal. Now, let's watch a video on the proper use and wearing of face masks. Keep in mind that your typical facial coverings, such as cloth masks or surgical masks, are there to protect the other people that you're around. So COVID-19 is spread by respiratory droplets. 
If we can reduce the respiratory droplets that come from me, for example, and then it decreases the risk of somebody else getting sick inside of that work area. So one I wanted to point out, this type of mask, this is known as an N95 respirator. These are the masks that are typically being used by our medical professionals, and these actually do have a filter inside of them. So notice they have two straps. If you have something that looks similar to this, but it has one strap, that is referred to as a dust mask. So you typically won't be wearing an N95. Some uh, people on campus who work in certain areas or with certain materials may be wearing an N95 already for their work duties. Um, however, we're gonna talk about cloth masks and surgical masks. So this is just a typical surgical mask. So you'll notice one side of it has a metal, um, a malleable metal bar to it. So you wanna put your mask on from your chin up, loop it around your ears, and then adjust it to where it fits securely around your nose and your mouth. You also wanna make sure that you fit that top malleable metal piece to appropriately fit over your nose to create a nice seal along the top of your mask. So when you're wearing a mask, for example, if you're working in a laboratory space and wearing a mask, you're gonna be handling chemicals or biological materials with your gloved hands. Don't touch your mask, don't touch your face, don't touch your eyes, your nose, your ears, anything that could potentially contaminate your mask. To remove a mask, of surgical style, remove it by the ear loops. So we're gonna talk about storing it as well. So you can remove that mask into a Tupperware container and then seal it up for later use. So you want to consider, after you've worn a mask, you wanna consider the front of your mask contaminated. So you don't wanna to directly touch the front of your mask because that's where your respiratory droplets are going to be collected. There's also masks that have ties and these are great because you can adjust how tight they are on your face to make sure you have an appropriate seal. So when you apply one of these masks, you wanna make sure that you tie the bottom first at the nape of your neck using a bow And then you wanna bring it up, fold it out. Some of them will have a metal piece in there. Make sure you fold that to your nose and then bring those other two straps around the very back of your head and make another bow. See? There we go, so I've got a nice tight seal here. So removing these, you wanna remove the bottom one first and then untie the top. And then you can do the same procedure on taking it off into a Tupperware container to use it for next time, okay? The last one I wanna talk about is a cloth mask with the elastic loops. So this one does not have um, a metal band in it, but so I'm gonna put it on chin first, bring it up over my nose. But you see how loose how loosely fitting this is. So this is not really appropriate coverage. So I'm gonna show you a couple tricks. If you have um, a carabiner, a small one or a large one, you can hook it on one of your ear loops and then bring it around and clasp it together behind your head. If you don't have a carabiner, use, I have two large clip paper clips clipped together because that's how tight I need my mask to be whenever I put it on. So you're going to stick the paper clips on one of your ear loops so you can put your mask on, put it over your face, and we're going to put our second ear loop through the paper clip as well. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to, to adjust to make sure that I'm comfortable. So you see how much tighter this is fitting? 
I have a nice seal here along my jawline. Can bring it down a little more so it's not into the bottom of my eyelids. And I would keep adjusting a little bit um, along my ears to make sure they're a little more comfortable than what they are right now, especially if I'm gonna be wearing this long term. And then you remove the same way by the ear loops into a container for storage. So cleaning your masks, um, surgical masks are not very easy to clean. Um, so as they become contaminated, you wanna replace it with a new one. Your cloth masks, however, um, you can launder them um, inside of a delicates bag if you have one. If you don't, I recommend that you hand wash with soap and warm water and then just let it dry on its own. If you have a mask of your own that you've been wearing out in public per the CDC recommendations already, feel free to use that one as you return to work. If you wear glasses, there are two methods you can use to prevent or reduce the fogging of your lenses while wearing a face mask. You can apply a thin layer of liquid dish soap or a layer of shaving cream and then rinse it off using warm water and dry your glasses gently. The next set of prevention measures to be discussed include improved health hygiene practices. Health hygiene practices including not touching your eyes, nose, and mouth, your mucous membranes to prevent potential infection, staying home when you are sick, except to get medical care, and covering your cough or sneeze with a tissue, then throwing the tissue in the trash and washing your hands. Some of you, as we return to campus, will be wearing personal protective equipment, or PPE, that you may or may not be used to wearing. So, we're going to discuss the proper order to put on and take off your PPE. Donning, which is to put on your PPE, has very specific steps. First, put on your body protection. This can be a lab coat, gown, or apron. Next, put on your face mask. Third, put on your eye protection. This can be safety glasses or splash goggles. If you are also wearing a face shield, Make sure you don your safety glasses or goggles first and then secure your face shield. Lastly, you will put on your hand protection, most commonly in the form of gloves. Whenever you are complete with your work and ready to take off or doff your PPE, you essentially do this in a reverse order. First, you will remove your hand protection or your gloves which are most likely to be the most contaminated PPE on your person. Next, remove your eye protection using the ear pieces. Make sure to not touch the front of your safety glasses or face shield because they should be considered contaminated. Next, you want to remove your body protection and either discard it or store it for later use Lastly, you will remove your face mask and either discard it or store it for later use. Now that we discussed the correct way to don and doff PPE, let's talk about proper glove removal. Whenever you don gloves, which means put on, you should make sure that you don't touch um, your face, your mouth, any of your personal items that you would touch with ungloved hands, such as your cell phone, your purse, something like that. So I have my gloves on. I'm gonna use some paint here um, to mock some contamination um, on my gloves. So I have contaminated gloves and how do I take them off without touching my skin and then thus contaminating my person? So you wanna pinch the palm of one of your gloves. You never wanna go from the very bottom because then you'll touch your skin and pull off that first glove. You want to make sure you pull it off slowly, otherwise you're going to aerosolize whatever contaminants happen to be on your glove at that time. So you ball that glove up in your still gloved hand. So I call this clean hand, dirty hand. Take your clean hand, and this one can go underneath the cuff of your glove. And then you want to pull that one off inside out as well. So then you want to make sure that you dispose of your gloves into a trash receptacle. 
While not everyone returning to campus will be wearing personal protective equipment, everyone will be washing their hands. Let's watch a demonstration on how to effectively wash your hands. I'm here to provide a demonstration on how to properly wash your hands or use a hand sanitizer. Uh, you want to make sure that you use warm water and soap and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. But how do you actually do that to make sure that you wash your hands appropriately? So I'm going to use some paint in this demonstration to serve as my soap. So the first thing you do, wet your hands, get your soap, rub your palms together to create a nice lather of your soap suds. So now you can see that my palms are covered with soap, but I have a lot of spaces on my hands that have not had contact with my soap yet. So you to make sure you get in between your fingers and that includes doing the backs of your hands, of each hand in between your fingers with the opposite palm. You wanna grasp your hands, your fingers together like this to make sure you get your fingers and you're gonna do that in both hands. Let's see, I still have some blank. Uh, rotational rubbing of your thumbs with the opposite palm. We'll make sure that you get all around that thumb and the other one. You wanna make sure you do your fingertips as well. Um, your cuticles, your wrist, and your thumbs tend to be places where contamination is held. So making sure you pay special attention to those areas. And then you wanna make sure you do rotational rubbing of your wrist with the opposite hand. So now you see my gloves are all coated in black, or my hands. So this is soap contact with my hands. And whenever you rinse, you wanna make sure that you rinse fingertips to your wrist, because that's gonna wash any bacteria or dirt, the contaminants you're removing from your hands, from your fingertips, which are the most likely going to be contacting whatever it is you happen to be touching next. So you're gonna use this same method with um, hand sanitizer. And thank you for watching. Stay safe. The last set of prevention measures that we will discuss are disinfectants and disinfection practices. It is all our responsibility. Custodial services on campus will do regular cleaning and disinfection of commonly touched surfaces once daily. You should implement a plan in your work area to frequently disinfect commonly touched surfaces. Shared equipment should be disinfected before and after each use by the individual user. Now let's watch a video that discusses different types of disinfectants and how to appropriately disinfect surfaces. I'm here today to talk to you about disinfectants and disinfecting. So there's many different types of disinfectants. I have a few here modeled, um, but disinfectants can be bactericidal, sporicidal, uh, viricidal, um, and so they kill different types of harmful um, organisms, bacteria, virus, spores, mold, etc. So it's important to know what type of disinfectant you need to be using. There are several different types of common disinfectants that are used. We'll also provide a table of common disinfectants that gives you information such as the usable concentration, shelf life, and any of the hazards posed by these different disinfectants. These ones include sodium hypochlorate, which is your typical bleach, phenols, um, quat quaternary ammonium compounds, which are typically um, in your disinfectant sprays such as Lysol. Hydrogen peroxide is a very common and cheap disinfectant. And then your alcohol base, such as isopropanol or ethanol, are very common disinfectants. Each of them have pros and cons, for example, alcohols are flammable. Your hyperchlorates are very corrosive. So you wanna make sure that you choose an appropriate disinfectant for whatever you happen to be disinfecting so you don't end up damaging the materials that we're trying to keep clean. So we're gonna talk about common disinfection. Um, after you've used a piece of equipment or before you use a piece of equipment, leaving your workspaces, things like that. Um, so first of all, I want to mention that chemical disinfectants are only for use on inanimate objects. Don't apply chemical disinfectants to your skin 
either wash your hands or use um, an alcohol-based hand sanitizer to wash your hands. Definitely don't mix chemical disinfectants. They're not meant to be mixed. Um, harmful reactions can occur should the wrong types of disinfectants be mixed together. Um, you want to make sure that you properly use, store, and dispose of any sort of chemical disinfectants that you're using. Um, all chemical disinfectants have a large slew of precautionary statements, directions for use, etc. on their bottles per the hazard communication standard. So make sure that you review that information prior to using any sort of disinfectant. So let's talk basic steps to disinfection. First, you want to clear away any sort of debris um, or organic material first. Then you want to make sure that you um, prepare your disinfectant if it's something that needs to be prepared. Um, so here I have hydrogen peroxide, um, isopropyl alcohol. These are things that don't need to be prepared ahead of time. Depending on your concentration of isopropyl alcohol, um, it's most effective at a 70% um, solution. So you can take your concentration, dilute it with some water, and then you can achieve the appropriate um, <clears throat> concentration for use. So these are essentially shelf-stable. Your disinfectant wipes are also shelf-stable. Your sp disinfectant sprays of different types are shelf-stable. Um, the one disinfectant that I wanna mention that is not able to be used straight out of a bottle typically is a bleach solution. You have to dilute your bleach. Uh, we recommend a 2% solution um, because bleach is very corrosive. So you wanna make sure that you're not corroding any of the surfaces that you're actually trying to disinfect or decontaminate. Usually if you mix uh, your disinfectant in a spray bottle, make sure that you label it appropriately. So sometimes you're gonna wear gloves, sometimes you're not, if you're going to be using a disinfectant. Uh, I typically recommend wearing gloves if you do have them available, just so you don't have any of that chemical residue left on your hands. If you're working somewhere in like a laboratory space, you're already going to be wearing gloves uh, before you decontaminate your surfaces. So basic steps, step one, we're gonna talk about removing any debris. So that could be, you know, salt crystals, dirt, anything like that that's left on your work surface. Prepare your disinfectant. And then step three, you wanna apply disinfectant. Let's see how well you can see this. And you want to apply enough disinfectant for that surface to stay wet for the appropriate contact time. Contact time is the amount of time that a disinfectant needs to be in contact with the surface to appropriately decontaminate or disinfect that surface. So every one of these disinfectants here will have a different contact time. Read your manufacturer labels to identify the appropriate contact time and make sure that whatever surface you're disinfecting, you choose the appropriate disinfectant. We also wanna talk about surfaces or items that should be frequently disinfected. So that's gonna to mean to include things like light switches, door handles, push handles on doors, um, the surrounding door panel where people often touch with their hands, um, common use equipment such as copiers or coffee makers, or um, shared laboratory equipment. These are things that need to be decontaminated and cleaned very regularly. Um, personal note, your electronics, your cell phones, your keyboards, your mouse for your computer, in your car, your steering wheel, your shift lever, um, the buttons on your radio, on your air conditioner. These are all things that we touch frequently. Uh, so making sure that we decontaminate those regularly our custodial staff um, here at Texas Tech will be wonderful in decontaminating those frequently touched surfaces daily. And we recommend that you decontaminate these items uh, before your shift is over. You can also decontaminate them at the beginning of your shift, especially if you have shared spaces where you know other people are working or shared equipment that you're sharing it's best practice for you to go ahead and disinfect that equipment prior to your use and then after your use is concluded as well, just to make sure that we are taking as many precautions as we can to keep everyone safe. 
Thank you for watching. Returning to work on campus is going to look a little differently. Let's talk about the requirements and what you can expect when you return. The requirements. Personnel must complete a COVID-19 health assessment prior to reporting for work each day. Your options are to visit an on-campus health assessment station or to complete the CDC self-checker and maintain the results of all your surveys and provide them if requested. Be sure to check the TTU operations website or TTU commitment website for the latest health assessment location information. You're also required to wear a face mask when in all campus buildings, except when you are alone in your private office or workspace. Visit the TTU Commitment webpage for the latest information about TTU's commitment to the safety, health, and wellness of all Red Raiders. You've been instructed in this video to wash, wait, and wear, but what does returning to the office really look like? Let's take a look. This is an example of what social distancing might look like in your office. Make sure that your seating areas, if you have people that come in to wait in your office, are stationed six feet apart. Say I have someone in our file room, I'm going to wait here to make sure they have adequate space to enter and exit that room. Notice some of our spaces have occupancy limits. The same is true for our break room. We have occupancy limits and we have a wait here sign. Oh, hi, Heather. Come on in. Good thing these chairs are six feet apart. In your office spaces, make sure that if you have guests coming in to speak with you, it's your choice. You can either remove yourself from your office to meet in a public space or invite them in to make sure that both of you are wearing a face mask. You can also establish enter and exit doors for your work area. Please consult with Disability Services and the Fire Marshal's Office to make sure that you meet the appropriate codes. Signage used in this video can be found through the TTU Commitment website. Additional signs can also be found through the EHS COVID-19 Resources Hub. As you come back to campus, make sure you wash, wait, and wear. Wreck them.
steps to take at work can include limiting occupancies to break rooms and common areas, eating in your office or off campus if you can, do not share meals with others, remove furniture to promote social distancing, keep hand sanitizer and disinfectant in your common areas, do not provide food or drink at any meeting, remember meetings are limited to less than 10 people, ride one person per university vehicle if possible, and disinfect after each use. If you have a private office, keep your door closed or pulled mostly shut if you can. There have been procedures established for the event of a confirmed COVID-19 case. The person will have had to have visited a campus building when they were tested as positive. First, the sick individual should self-isolate and seek medical attention immediately. Next, they should notify their immediate supervisor of illness. If you are a faculty, staff, or student employee, provide your supervisor the necessary information to complete the COVID-19 reporting form on the Human Resources COVID-19 website. If you're a student, submit your COVID-19 absence form on the Dean of Students website. Keep in mind that if you are a supervisor, you are responsible for completing the COVID-19 reporting form and checking in with your sick individual and notifying the rest of your section or department of the COVID-19 case. Please use the templates available that have been provided by Human Resources. Next, the sick, the sick individual should self-isolate for 14 days, work or study from home if you can, or utilize leave and or absence options. Always contact your supervisor prior to returning to work. If you are a student, consult with the student page. On-campus resources related to COVID-19 include the Operations Division, Environmental Health and Safety, Human Resources, where you can find the reporting form and any phase guidance as we return to our normal operations, if you're a researcher, find your information through the Office of Research and Innovation. Student information can be found through the Duke Students website. And the TTU Commitment website will detail lots of different information about the safety and precautions being taken on campus. The information collected to create this training video were gathered from credible resources, including the Center for Disease Control and the State of Texas guidelines for reopening if you have additional questions after watching the video, please reach out to your supervisor or the other departments who are involved in the COVID-19 response plans. This includes environmental health and safety, the central warehouse, the operations division, procurement services, human resources. Researchers can reach out to the research and innovation office and the COVID-19 administrator has now been established where the email address is covid19 at ttu.edu. Please be sure to check out the EHS COVID-19 Resources Hub for additional information and standard operating procedures for use of disinfectants, vehicles, and break rooms. Thank you for watching.